Good Friday morning. I'm Joe Fryer in Washington. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, one step closer. A federal judge has now made clear that he's willing to unseal at least part of that affidavit used to search former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. This morning, we'll take you behind that decision and why the Justice Department wants to keep those documents sealed for now. Stay home, an NBC News exclusive this morning. According to Ukrainian intelligence, Russian officials have allegedly told workers at Europe's largest nuclear power plant not to go into work today. The speculation now swirling around a rumored planned incident at the Ukrainian facility under Russian control. Enough is enough. A summer of turbulent times at America's airports now prompting a sharp response from the Department of Transportation. Its new message to airliners, shape up or face the consequences. We'll bring you Secretary Pete Buttigieg's scathing letter to an industry under fire. Plus, trotting the globe, two royal brothers making two very different solo trips around the world. We've got the details on Prince William's just announced New York City romp as Prince Harry makes a surprise trip to his second home in southeastern Africa. Joe is going to bring us that story later in the hour. Joe, who looks great this morning in Washington, D.C., and we're happy to have you with us on this Friday. And this morning, we're one step closer to the FBI's reasoning for searching former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago home. A Florida judge is now allowing for some of that search warrant affidavit to be unsealed. Trump has been calling for the release of those documents, along with several news organizations, including NBC News. The Justice Department wants to keep that information secret because it's part of an ongoing investigation. We have a lot to go through this morning with the judge's decision. Let's bring in NBC News justice reporter Ryan Riley and NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalo. So, Ryan, starting with you, help us understand the judge's decision and the reasoning behind it. I know there was a little bit of confusion yesterday. And, and also, how are the FBI and the Justice Department reacting to this? Yeah, I think there's a little bit of surprise that uh, he, he went this, this route. Um, we still don't know for sure if anything is going to necessarily come out, but it seems like we might get some very basic details. Essentially, what he believes is that DOJ shouldn't be making the call about whether or not there's any information that could come out that could be relevant. That wasn't a decision that uh, should be left up to DOJ. DOJ's argument here is essentially that the redactions would be so extreme that it would essentially render the document meaningless. But he decided that that's not what he wanted to do. And the judge said here, I find that the present record the government has not, uh, I find that on the present record, the government has not met its burden of showing that the entire affidavit uh, should remain sealed. So that's sort of what the judge uh, issued here and said it's a deadline of next week for uh, DOJ to propose those uh, redactions. And I think DOJ's redactions are going to be um, a lot. They're, it's going to be a lot of black marks on that paper that we could be seeing uh, coming out of this. Now, Danny, there's been pressure from news outlets to get this information public. First, let's listen to what one attorney for several media companies said after yesterday's hearing. It is not the government's job to tell the public what is meaningful in terms of the release of its own information. Now, the Justice Department disagreed with that, saying that the investigation's still in its early stages. So how do they release parts of these documents without sabotaging their case? Is there a world where that's possible? That's the dilemma now for DOJ. And I suspect that we haven't seen the end of the controversy because DOJ is going to go back to their offices and heavily redact these documents and err on the side of secrecy. But they're going to have to submit that back to the judge who will likely be none too pleased when the only thing remaining from the search warrant affidavit is going to be something like once upon a time and happily ever, ever after at the end. They're going to have to redact almost everything, and the judge probably isn't looking for that. Now, there is language in a search warrant that can probably remain, like, I don't know, the agent's history with these kinds of cases. They usually recite that at the beginning. I've been an agent for X number of years. I've participated in X number of cases. You might see that remaining, but anything that's substantive that has to do with the investigation, I have to believe DOJ is going to redact, even though they know the judge isn't going to be pleased. So adding to this once upon a time fairy tale, Ryan, is that a source familiar with the matter tells NBC News inside Trump world, there are actually discussions about whether to release surveillance video of the search. What are you learning about that? What's the Justice Department saying about it? You know, I think it's one of those we'll see, uh, we'll believe it when we see it sort of scenarios, because uh, I don't know if that's necessarily the best strategic move for them to have 
footage out there of the government taking back all of these documents that belong to the government. Uh, you know, if you set the classification issue aside, Trump obviously had a bunch of documents that he wasn't supposed to have under the President for Records Act. Um, but I think, you know, at DOJ, the FBI, the big concern here would obviously once again be uh, the safety of, of the FBI agents who participated in this, because we've seen attacks on the FBI. Uh, we've seen targeting of the FBI agents who are involved in this in this search. So they're going to want to make sure that the faces aren't going to come out um, in this scenario in any video that was released from, um, from by the Trump side here. All right, Ryan and Danny, thank you so much. Thank you both. Now, this morning, there are growing fears of a potential incident at Europe's largest nuclear power plant. Both Ukraine and Russia are accusing each other of planning a provocation at the Zaporizhia facility today. It comes as President Zelensky met with the Turkish president and the U.N. Secretary General in western Ukraine yesterday. The U.N. chief said he was, quote, gravely concerned about the situation unfolding at the plant, which has already seen fighting in the past few weeks. Common sense must prevail to avoid any actions that might endanger the physical integrity, safety or security of the nuclear plant. And the facility must not be used as part of any military operation. Military equipment and personnel should be withdrawn from the plant. Further deployment of forces or equipment to the site must be avoided. The area needs to be demilitarized. And we must tell it as it is. Any potential damage to Zaporizhia is suicide. NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman joins us now from Dnipro, Ukraine. Josh, thanks for being with us. So let's walk a little bit through this sort of they said, they said type of thing that's making this a little confusing. So these tensions are super high. I know you hear from a Ukrainian intelligence official about Russia's alleged plans for a provocation and then also telling their staff to stay home. Obviously, they're saying the opposite. What did he tell you? What did this Ukrainian official tell you? And what's the situation like right now? Well, the tensions certainly are very high, but you're right, Savannah, it is confusing because for days now, Russia and Ukraine have been accusing each other of shelling that plant and of planning some type of incident there. So yesterday, when we heard from Russia's defense ministry saying that they believed Ukraine was going to plan something at the site today, uh, many Ukrainian officials said that's Russia laying the groundwork to do something at the plant itself uh, today and then try to blame it on Ukraine. And then I spoke spoke with Andrei Yusov from Ukraine's military intelligence unit, who told me this. There is new information. It arrived about half an hour ago, that for tomorrow, August 19th, there is an order for the majority of the station staff not to go to work. This may be evidence that the Russians are preparing for large-scale provocations at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant for tomorrow. So Russia has its own nuclear experts from its state-run energy company at that site. Uh, what Yusuf is saying there is that Russia's told them, steer clear of the site today, which is really only raising more fears that Russia may be planning something there today, as both sides have been holding uh, nuclear disaster drills to try to prepare Savannah. Uh, Josh, let's talk through some of what we are seeing on the ground there. We have this video that surfaced on social media appearing to show Russian military vehicles inside the nuclear power plant. Now, it's important to note here that we don't know who filmed this, no indication of that or when it was shot. But the head of Ukraine's national nuclear energy company, I know, told you earlier this month that something like this was happening. What did you hear and what could this mean? That's exactly right. The head of Energoatom, the state nuclear energy company here, told me that Russia had already moved military vehicles inside the turbine halls of nuclear reactor one and two. Dozens of vehicles that he said were blocking access to fire brigades if there were to be a fire in the nuclear reactor. And in fact, were fire hazards themselves because he said those military vehicles are weaponized, may have explosives on them. Obviously, the last thing you want to see inside a nuclear power plant. And then that video uh, from social media now uh, been corroborated by NBC News as from uh, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant appearing to show exactly what the head of the energy company told us the Russians had put there. All right, Josh, thank you so much. Obviously, a lot to be watching for today as both sides claim this activity at a nuclear power plant. We know you'll stay on it for us and stay safe. Thank you.
The historic drought that has ravaged much of the West for years is now choking the Northeast. In fact, the government agency that monitors climate says the drought is affecting 174 million Americans. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has the story. Of course, we've been seeing those dramatic images out of the West, but this new drought monitor shows that the Northeast is now seeing its own intensifying drought. These are not images from the desert Southwest. They're from Massachusetts. The new weekly drought monitor out shows that more of the Northeast is now under extreme drought conditions. I'm kind of worried because my house also, the grass is dead. Nearly all of New Jersey, Connecticut, and New Hampshire are also in varying levels of drought. Dairy farms in Vermont are struggling to feed their livestock. New York's Rockland County is declaring a stage two water emergency, instituting mandatory restrictions. You could only water lawns on certain days here. And restaurants can't serve water unless customers specifically ask. It's going to affect us significantly. Anthony Tortorello says his landscaping company has already lost nearly half its business. We haven't had any decent rain. Nothing is really growing. It's really affecting my business. This river is much drier than usual. Normally, I'd be standing in water here. Local officials say this is the worst drought they've seen in at least six years. It's the next phase of a punishing drought that has already ravaged the southwestern U.S. This, I think, is the worst year we've ever had. In Texas, two reservoirs of the Rio Grande are drying up. Drought's going to be a huge issue in the U.S. in the coming decades because it's going to affect water supplies and it's going to affect growing food. And both of those are critical to our economy. And it's going to mean that we can't keep living the way we do. Experts say climate change is reaching unprecedented levels worldwide. A record-breaking heat wave in China is shutting down semiconductor factories, including those that make microchips exported to the U.S. Back here in the Northeast, forecasters say there is a chance for some rain next week, but not nearly enough to make a dent in this drought. Back to you. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, thank you. So which parts of the country will get some rain this weekend? Maybe a little relief. Let's get a check at your morning news now weather. And meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us with that and what you can expect as you head out the door this morning. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, guys. Great to see you. And yeah, some of us will see rain today, also into the weekend. Unfortunately, some of it's going to come fast and it's going to come furious. So we do have a flash flooding concern in portions of the Midwest. We could see some severe storms later on this afternoon and evening. Also looking at the chance for flash flooding throughout the Gulf Coast states into the southeast, also coastal South Carolina. That's going to be a bullseye where we could see some flash flooding. The main concern today and also this weekend is into the southwest. We're looking at that monsoonal rain really, uh, really uh, ramping up this weekend. And in addition to an area of low pressure, they're going to come together. They're going to bring heavy rain. And we're looking at moderate risk for flash flooding. That doesn't get issued very often. We rarely see it. We're going to see that today. Another moderate risk tomorrow. That's in portions of Arizona, also New Mexico. That's where you see the pink. So Phoenix and Tucson could see some flash flooding. And remember, flash flooding is life-threatening. So we need to be concerned with that. We're looking at the chance for six inches of rain in some spots. We do have 9 million people impacted by a flood alert. We have a flood watch. That's in the green. So portions of Utah into Colorado, Texas, New Mexico, also Arizona. And we're seeing flash flooding come in and out. Flash flood warnings, that's when it's happening right now. So we see them pop in, we pop out, and we're going to watch it as we go throughout uh, today and also throughout the weekend. Radar showing us that the rain is already falling. We're looking at the brighter colors. That's the heavier rain. You can see that rotation sort of rotating that rain in, and it's going to be heavy as we head throughout the next couple of days. Again, generally one to three inches, but we could see five, even six inches of rain. This part of the country has clear a lot of clay in the soil, so it doesn't really absorb water very fast. And this is going to come fast, so this is going to be a problem as we head throughout the next couple of days. We're also looking at the Midwest. That's one cold front where we could see the chance for severe storms later on this afternoon. The main threat would be winds. We could also see some hail with those storms. And then we're watching that slow-moving cold front throughout the southeast. We've been watching it for days. We're going to continue to watch it. And that's bringing the chance for those scattered storms today and also tomorrow. Back to you guys. All right, Michelle. All right, thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Welcome back. After experiencing record-breaking heat, parts of Europe are going dark. It's just the latest fallout from the continent's ongoing energy crisis driven by the war in Ukraine. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley joins us now with more. Hey, Matt, good morning. 
Hey, good morning, Joe. So actually, the latest thing that we're hearing is yesterday, Olaf Scholz, he's the chancellor of Germany, embattled by this energy crisis that's actually sweeping the whole continent, including here in Britain. He just announced a reduction in taxes on gas from 19% to 7%. So, as you can see, that's a major reduction, and it really speaks to the crisis and how difficult it is for governments throughout Europe to deal with rising energy costs. In Europe, it's lights out at major monuments and tourist attractions as a long, hot summer gives way to what officials worry could be a bitterly cold winter. Skyrocketing energy prices have put Europe on a war footing, with Russia as the enemy. Nous sommes dans ce qu'on appelle une guerre hybride. We are in what can be described as a hybrid war, said French President Emmanuel Macron. Russia uses energy resources, like it does food, as a war weapon to exert pressure. Oil prices have doubled, coal prices have quadrupled, and natural gas is now seven times more expensive than early last year, according to the IMF. Russia blames Western sanctions for raising prices around the world. Ukraine and its allies blame Russia's invasion, accusing Moscow of deliberately withholding its fuel and food to punish the West. Alongside Russia's war in Ukraine, economists blame a surge in energy use after the pandemic and intense heat and drought that are hurting energy production. But for energy users, it's a crisis no matter the cause. Doris Perul has long relied on public welfare, but now she has to resort to food banks like this one. She's worried that even that won't be enough. I'm already at the limit. I don't know yet how to get through the next two weeks, she said. I see everything rising, the rent, power. I don't know how things will develop. Some in Germany are taking matters into their own hands with solutions that might look like a blast from the past. About two hours outside Berlin, residents of this small town have turned to wood chips for fuel. We have to be innovative, said the project's organizer. If we don't act and just rely on the government to solve the crisis, we'll never succeed. This burner will soon fuel most of this village of 60 people. But policymakers are taking notice. France will start turning off lights this fall and imposing tough restrictions, what Macron calls energy sobriety. Germans are already facing restrictions and are showing their anger. And these jeers when Germany's chancellor tried to address the topic. German domestic intelligence agencies are already warning of a winter of rage should extremist parties exploit the price increase for protests and violence. Fuel prices are rising faster in Britain than anywhere else in Europe. By October, a typical family will be paying more than $4,000 a year. That's why Simon Howard started Don't Pay UK to resist rising costs. He blames energy companies um, and their substantial profits for the rising prices. The surge in energy prices is predicted in this country is such that people were already planning this as a form of action. Howard has appealed online for a million pledges from energy users to stop paying their bills if energy companies raise their prices on October 1st. I was paying. 100,000 people have already signed up. It's why so many Europeans are worried about a coming winter of discontent. So as you can see, Joe, the next foot to drop is going to be on October 1st here in London. And that is when, or in Britain, that's when we're going to hear whether energy costs for people like me who live here are going to increase dramatically and cause a lot of pain and, from the looks of it, a lot of anger. Guys? Looks like something a lot of folks will be pay atten paying attention to. Matt Bradley, thank you so much. Let's stay on some international news and powerful storms have killed at least 12 people in Central and Southern Europe. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Labanga joins us from Rome with that and other world news headlines. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, guys. Yes, those 12 people who died were killed mainly by falling trees and flying debris caused by these sudden storms that caught everyone by surprise here in Europe, including tourists in Venice who were forced to flee in a panic after a sudden gusts of winds blew away umbrellas and chairs in the central St. Mark's Square. Elsewhere in Europe, like in the French island of Corsica, winds of up to 140 miles per hour uprooted trees down damaged mobile homes and camping grounds. Let's move to Finland, where the Prime Minister, Sanna Marin, is facing criticism after a video of her dancing and singing with friends was leaked on social media. Opposition parties criticized her behavior, with one leader demanding she takes a drug test. Marin, who is 36, denied taking drugs and said she was just having perfectly legal fun. And let's end this short tour of the world in Tanzania, or rather, at the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro 
Kilimanjaro, where a broadband where a broadband network has been set up. Internet coverage will be guaranteed to up to a height of 12,200 feet, allowing climbers to post pictures of themselves and the views, of course, in real time, guys. Wow, All right. That's pretty cool. Thank you, Claudio. Now to some heartbreaking news for our NBC family, the passing of the eldest son of our very own Richard Engel. Richard and his wife have spent years bringing awareness to Rett syndrome, a rare genetic neurological disorder that still has no cure or even treatment. NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt has our tribute to little Henry. This is also what he's faced tragedy and conflict across the world. But the news that reached Richard Engel while on foreign assignment one day in 2017 was like nothing he had ever faced. I got back in this convoy, like shaking. It was the worst day of my, my life. Richard and his wife Mary Forrest learning their then two year old son had an extremely rare and incurable genetic condition. I called you, I said, we have a result, and I said, it's not good. It's, it's not just delay. It means lifelong, permanent, untreatable, physical, and intellectual impairment. As he physically grew, Henry was unable to walk, speak, or efficiently feed himself. A tough journey was ahead. Richard and Mary chose to share it publicly. We wanted to raise awareness. The worst days. I think it's the hardest that it's ever felt as a caregiver. Physically, mentally, worrying, the anxiety about what's going to happen with him, regression, what does the future look like? And they shared the best days. Swimming in the sea. Like the celebration when Richard first heard those two unforgettable words. Henry looked at me and he called me Dada. Mm. The first time, uh, just a few days ago, and it was something I'd been waiting for for years. Physical therapy helped, briefly sitting up unsupported, a major milestone. Richard and Mary dedicated themselves to creating awareness of Rett syndrome. Researchers even learning things from Henry, okay. studying his cells to one day help others. But in May, Richard tweeted Henry had taken a turn for the worse but it was home getting love from brother Theo. Richard and Mary tweeting the crushing news that Henry had passed away, writing he had the softest blue eyes, an easy smile, and a contagious giggle. We always surrounded him with love, and he returned it, and so much more. Richard and Mary's beloved Henry was six years old. If you'd like to support Rett Syndrome Research, you can donate in Henry's name at Texas Children's Hospital. All right, Lester, thank you so much. Oh, I remember the first time I talked to Richard when he was going to be a dad and how excited he was, how incredible he was through that whole journey. Even though you see him doing what he's doing around the world all the time, our thoughts and prayers are with Richard, Mary, Theo, and the entire Engel family. Welcome back. The White House and the CDC are taking new steps to try and stop the spread of monkeypox. The plan includes a shipment of 1.8 million doses of vaccine that will be available Monday and 50,000 courses of the antiviral medication T-pox. The administration is also making more vaccines available for jurisdictions hosting large LGBT LGBTQI plus events in hopes of spreading the word about vaccines and safety. And at the same time, there are new questions about how the disease is spread with new research showing sex between men, not skin contact, is fueling monkeypox. For more, we're joined by NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba and NBC News medical contributor and emergency room physician Dr. Uche Blackstock. She's also the CEO of Advancing Health Equity. Good morning to both of you. Monica, I will start with you and the White House's plans. I mean, the U.S. first has more infections than any other country, and the White House has been under a lot of pressure to do more to forcefully fight monkeypox. Do they believe this plan, these particular resources, are enough to slow the spread? They hope so, Savannah, and this is the White House enacting what they're calling stage four of the vaccine distribution plan. So remember a couple of weeks ago, there was immense pressure to try to get more of a national response. They appointed this national coordinator and the White House has been trying to give updates. So these additional doses they're hoping will be helpful. But the other major shift they've done recently is that now the shots can go basically into your skin instead of into the fat. So any kind of vial can now 
offer five shots instead of just one. And there's a little bit of controversy about how that's going to work, but they're thinking obviously that's going to make it available to more people. And places like Los Angeles County in California and Fulton County in Georgia have now completely switched over to doing the shots that way. So they're hoping more people are going to be able to get them. But of course, this does come as the CDC is under intense pressure and criticism overall, not just for the response on monkeypox, but on also the COVID pandemic. And they're admitting that there have been failures here in terms of public health. So they're trying to do everything they can, but there are still a lot of questions mm -hmm. about why it took so long to get these additional vaccine doses available, Savannah. Absolutely. Dr. Blackstock, let me bring you in here. So, I mean, the CDC has been under fire for a lot of things for a while, but particularly right now for its response to the monkeypox outbreak with more than 13,000 cases in the U.S. I mean, the center's own director is calling for this reorg as they face these several mounting health concerns all at the same time. Do you have confidence when you hear these steps, when we know now how many vaccines can come from each vial, as Monica just pointed out, and the numbers that you hear there? Do you have confidence that this is going to help make significant steps in getting this under control? Savannah, thanks for having me. I, I do think it is an important step. We already know that we don't have enough vaccine supply for the population that's being most impacted, um, but this we, we but we still need more. We, we we need more vaccines, but we also need to decrease uh, barriers to access. So getting those antivirals are still very difficult. There's a very onerous bureaucratic process to <clears throat> to physicians even uh, prescribing and and giving that medication uh, to patients. And also we've seen even if vaccines are available, we've already seen racial health disparities in who's getting those vaccines with. Black and Latinx men being disproportionately underrepresented among people getting vaccinations, but overrepresented in terms of infections and cases in different parts of the country. So that outreach part is going to be incredibly important. Absolutely. Monica, as we saw with COVID, it's one thing, you know, to have these vaccines to increase supply, and it's another to actually make sure that they're getting into arms to make sure people seek them out, schedule those appointments. How's the White House working to make sure people actually do go get vaccinated, especially in certain communities? The White House is saying they're trying to go to the most at-risk population and to go to specific events where there may be large gatherings in the LGBTQ community. So, for instance, this upcoming weekend, they're going to be going to the Charlotte Pride Festival and Parade in North Carolina. So they're really going to try to meet the most vulnerable people in this public health emergency where they are at. And they're wanting to do that so that also they hope that anyone who then gets the shot can spread the word to all of their family or friends who might be vulnerable to try to do this same thing and hoping that that word of mouth is helpful because it is one thing to just hear about it. There may be all these government websites. It may be complicated to navigate. There aren't enough vaccines. How do I get an appointment? So they're hoping that by people coming to these specific events, that can help just do it in a more quick way, as they saw with the COVID vaccine. They're trying to draw lessons from that as well, Savannah. And Dr. Blackstock, let's talk about that community and these specific studies. I mean, what are we seeing here in terms of what the studies are showing with how it is spreading and what's the takeaway? Way. Right. So I think what's important for people to realize is that we are learning more and more about monkeypox in terms of how it's transmitted. Typically, it's been transmitted um, in, in Western and Central Africa by contact with infected animals. Uh, this outbreak looks very, very different. We're seeing it associated with sexual activity. There still is a question about whether it, it's considered a sexually transmitted infection, meaning whether or not it's not only found in seminal fluid or vaginal fluid, but also if it can be transmitted through that fluid. There is growing evidence that that may be the case. But I think what's most important is that we continue this research to, to better understand how it is being transmitted, but that we're also targeting, as you've already mentioned, the demographics and the groups that are being impacted. So gay, bisexual, and men who have sex with men, we, we need to really target those communities, but do it in a way that is uh, not stigmatizing and doesn't perpetuate homophobia or transphobia. Dr. Uche Blackstock and Monica Alba, as always, thank you both so much for joining us. And turning now to education, millions of American students are heading back to school after months and in some cases years of remote learning. These adjustments have been rocky for some, both academically and socially. But our sponsor, the Walton Family Foundation, and our friends over at Nightly News Kids Edition learned about a new program in a North Carolina school that's helped students get the extra support they need. Here's NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt. My sophomore year, the pandemic hit, and I was doing okay, but I'd rather be at school. 
virtual was a little hard for me. For many students across the country, the return to the classroom at the start of this school year was a challenge after months of remote learning during the pandemic. To help address the learning loss problem, Guilford County Schools in North Carolina launched Learning Hubs, an after-school program offering extra help and support for students. At Eastern Guilford High School, some 250 students have taken part in the twice-a-week program this year, where they receive personalized tutoring and so much more. It helps me improve my grades a lot by learning more stuff. I like that you can go in and just like just be yourself. So remember that positive, negative, or no. The teachers, they, they really engage with the students. They really make sure everybody's doing work, getting better. The hubs allow for individualized learning. The key element is really spending that one-on-one -on -one time. Every student has a different learning style and every teacher has different teaching methods. But uh, once you zoom in on what is it uh, that the students is lacking, uh, what part of the concept they're missing, and you fix that, then the student really can thrive and progress in their uh, mathematical understanding of uh, whatever subject they're studying. And students are improving in just about every subject. I improved a lot on civics. What I'm working on right now is math, math three. Students also received meals and transportation home. The hub has become a safe haven for a lot of our students and they, they just really, really tap into our staff. I think they're really comfortable. I think that it creates a, a good meal for the students. And there are incentives. We provide a plethora of incentives as long as our students attend at least 80% of the time that from when they start at the hub to the very end, um, every student will receive a $200 stipend. And the learning team has even been helpful for one of the school's sports teams, whose coach, Mr. Yates, was worried about players' performance off the field. In the football team, it's been a big issue with grades and everything. Well, he was like basically saying, if I want to stay on the team and go to college, I need to get my grades up. He told me about the learning hub or whatever, so I was like, I'm gonna think about it now if I have a straight A's. As the school year comes to a close, the teachers and educators involved have noticed a big difference. And some teachers are hoping it catches on nationwide. I think it's needed in every school. Every high school, I mean, I couldn't think of a school which would not need something similar to the Learning Hub. Because that individual part, one-on-one -on -one with the student, and zooming in on whatever and the specific concept they try to understand. You can't really give that in a regular classroom. Students making the grades and believing in themselves. It's good to hear that, yes, we did do something positive and it makes them feel good at the same time while achieving their goals. Our thanks to Lester Holt for bringing us that story. Welcome back. As this rough summer travel season winds down, NBC News has learned the Department of Transportation is issuing an ultimatum to the airlines. Improve your customer service or the government will step in. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello covers aviation for us. He broke this story. Tom, good morning to you. Yeah, good morning, Joe. So hundreds of thousands of passengers this past summer have experienced delays and cancellations. And that means, of course, missed weddings, missed baseball games, missed business meetings, whatever the case is. Now DOT Secretary Pete Buttigieg tells me that the airlines have got to up their game. They've got to not stop over-promising, he says. They've got to meet their schedules. They need to offer clarity to their airline passengers, offer good customer service. And if they don't do that, then DOT will proceed with a plan to do it for them. If you've flown this summer, there's a good chance you've got a story and a complaint. It's chaos, and I hope people have a better time uh, than we are having. In the first six months of the year, 24% of U.S. flights were delayed, 3.2% canceled. While violent weather and air traffic control problems contributed, the Department of Transportation says the airlines bear most of the blame for overscheduling flights despite not having enough pilots to fly them, then offering conflicting and confusing rules on cash refunds and voucher policies. 
three times in the last few weeks uh, I've been canceled. DOT Secretary Pete Buttigieg says the confusion needs to end now. The message to the airlines is that you've got to make it easier for passengers to understand their rights and you've got to support passengers when they experience delays or cancellations. In a new letter to the airlines, Secretary Buttigieg writes the level of disruption Americans have experienced this summer is unacceptable. He wants airlines to refund passengers' money and offer meal vouchers if a domestic flight is delayed more than three hours and provide hotel accommodations if a passenger must wait overnight. You're calling on the airlines to either voluntarily meet these requirements and regulations or you're going to do it for them? That's right. I'm giving them an opportunity to raise the bar. The airline industry tells NBC News its members comply with federal laws and regulations regarding cash refunds. Carriers strive to provide the highest level of customer service and are committed to working with travelers to address their individual circumstances. But two weeks ahead of Labor Day, travel pros suggest always having a backup plan if things go wrong. Know what's included in your ticket. If you can proactively move your flight around, if you have a refundable ticket, a ticket with no change fees, move to earlier in the day, potentially leave a day early. Yeah, Secretary Buttigieg tells me that the department is receiving record numbers of complaints about the airlines this summer. He also says because there is so much confusion about each individual airline policies on refunds, on, on uh, vouchers, for example, the DOT is about to roll out one-stop shopping, a website that explains all of it for each individual airline, spelling it all out, airline by airline, and that website will roll out in two weeks on Labor Day weekend. Joe? All right, could be a useful tool. Tom Costello, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Some good news there for travelers. All right, now the red-hot housing market appears to be cooling down. According to the National Association of Realtors, existing home sales fell by nearly 6% in July compared with June. And many experts even say the housing market is now in a recession. NBC News correspondent Emily Akata joins us now here on set. For more on this, hey, Emily, good morning. Good morning. Well, it's a very different picture from earlier this year. Homes are now selling at the slowest pace since 2015 aside from the start of the pandemic, and that's because high mortgage rates are pushing a lot of Americans out of the house hunt. This morning, lack of affordability is weighing down the housing market as would-be home buyers pump the brakes on signing a deed. Existing home sales fell for the sixth month in a row and dropped 20 percent compared to last year. Several experts now have said that the housing market is in a recession. House hunters are being sidelined by sky-high prices, up nearly 11 percent from a year ago, limited supply, and rising mortgage rates. There's no way I'd be able to afford this without a second job. Sophia Silva nearly backed out of buying a home in Chicago when mortgage rates surpassed 5 percent. It tacked on an extra several hundred dollars to her monthly payments. It was the panic of realizing um, how having to work a second job is going to be just a part of my reality now. Rising costs put this Minneapolis couple who built their home in a similar situation. Probably every other day, I, I, yeah. would, I would say, do we actually need to go back to the drawing board? Is there any relief in sight for home buyers? Home buyers are a little bit more in the driver's seat. We are seeing fewer bidding wars, so there is less competition in the market. But so far, that really hasn't hit home prices yet. And the reason is because there's still very little supply on the market and there is strong demand. Stubbornly high home prices are sending more people in search of rentals, but there's little relief there, too. All but three of the most populous metro areas in the U.S. saw rents increase from a year earlier. Cincinnati, Nashville, and Pittsburgh with the fastest rising prices. Rents are sky high, and that makes it even harder to save for a down payment. Typically, first-time home buyers make up 40% of sales, according to the National Association of Realtors. But in July, they only represented 29%, as the road to affordability is proving hard to find. A drop in demand in housing means dwindling competition. So that is good news for the buyers. But keep in mind, inventory remains limited. A typical home in the market in July, for instance, only lasted for about two weeks. So we're wow. talking homes are still flying uh, at pretty record pace. That's tied for a record, according to the National Association of Realtors. Wow. Oof, my gosh. So many things just still so crazy. All right, Emily, thank you so much. Now let's get you some other financial headlines. Apple says they've discovered a major security flaw that could allow hackers to take over your device. CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us with that and other money headlines. Bertha, good morning. 
Hey, good morning, Joe and Savannah. You know, if you keep getting prompted to update your devices, do it fast. Apple has disclosed a big security flaw for iPhones, iPads, and Macs that could potentially allow hackers to take complete control of your device. Apple says the issue may have been actively exploited. So security experts are advising users to update affected devices. That's the iPhone 6 and later models and newer iPad and Mac computers running Mac OS Monterey. And if your company isn't laying people off, the one next door may be soon. That's a key finding from a new survey by PwC, which polled executives and board members across a number of industries. Half of them say they are reducing headcounts or plan to, and more than half have implemented hiring freezes. We've heard that from a lot of the big tech firms out west. More than 40 percent are pulling job offers, and a similar amount are reducing or getting rid of signing bonuses. At the same time, PwC says two-thirds of companies say they are boosting pay or expanding mental health benefits for their workers. And the most common perk that they're giving folks right now is making remote work permanent for more people. Meantime, Rivian, the electric vehicle maker, is discontinuing the cheapest version of its electric pickup, a move that effectively raises the starting price by more than $5,000. In an email to customers, Rivian said that those who have pre-ordered the Explore package, which costs about $67,500, will need to upgrade to the 73K Adventure package or cancel their pre-order. They have until September 1st to decide. Rivian says there wasn't enough interest for the lower priced trucks, so they want to concentrate on making the cars that people are more interested in. But as you can imagine, guys, this is really controversial. And on these Rivian chat boards, people are <laughs> livid. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure. I mean, I guess if you're already going into 67,000, some might argue what's an extra 5,000, but still, that's, yeah. that's not And once people have already good. bought it, to just take it away. Also, look yeah. at Bertha. Yeah deep on like Rivian well, it Reddit. Eats up your whole <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah. Well, it eats up your whole uh, subsidy, right? It's like 70, most of it. Yeah. So if you get $7,500, right. I guess some of it will pay for some of it. But that still, it yeah. changes the whole dynamic mm -hmm. for people. Good point. All right, thank you, Bertha. Appreciate Anyhow. it. Thank you. Welcome back. We've got an update on a very important story. You may remember we talked about right here on this show last month when we spoke to the creator of TikTok's viral pink sauce. She calls herself Chef P. Now, she was facing questions over what's in the sauce, which has been described as tasting like ranch dressing, and whether or not it was even safe to eat. Here's what she had to say then to our Kate Snow. All of this false propaganda that's going on on the internet, uh, I'm just a victim of clout. There were a lot of trolls and a lot of people making fake reports saying that they were getting sick from the pink sauce. However, they never even made a pink sauce purchase. Well, now, Chef P back on top after signing a partnership with Dave's Gourmet. The company says it has changed the recipe, though, and will make the sauce, quote, on a commercial scale under the required food manufacturing guidelines. So you've been warned. Pink sauce is coming to a store near you, and now I guess you'll be able to decide for yourself. I have a lot of questions about that one, but I guess I need to try it first before I can make any judgments, right? I see a taste test in our future. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Those always go so well. All right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, this morning we are learning that Prince William is heading to America next month. The announcement comes after Prince Harry made a surprise visit to Africa this week, highlighting wildlife conservation efforts in Mozambique. And next month, Harry and Meghan Markle, they're going to visit Europe. Both princes keeping busy with travel focused on their passion projects. This morning, two very different royal brothers are making their marks with solo trips across the globe. Buckingham Palace announced that Prince William will travel to New York in September. A high-profile visit to Britain's greatest ally as he gets ready to step into a bigger leadership role in the family. He and Kate Middleton drew crowds when they visited the U.S. after their wedding in 2011. And for his younger brother, Harry, who's given up his royal duties, a surprise solo trip without his wife, Meghan Markle. He popped up in Mozambique, where his spokesperson says he welcomed a group of officials, conservationists and philanthropists from America, touring protected wildlife in nature areas. It's a continent that has been close to the Duke's heart for many years. Since I first visited Africa at 13 years old, 
I've always found hope on the continent. A place where he feels connected to his mother, Diana, who also raised awareness there. Harry is continuing his mother's legacy, starting his African charity in her memory. It's where I felt closest to my mother and sought solace after she died, and where I knew I had found a soulmate in my wife. Harry and Meghan's love for the continent is encased in her engagement ring, a diamond from Botswana, the location of one of their first dates. I managed to persuade her to come and join me in Botswana, and we, and we, we, we camped out with each other under the stars. As a royal couple, they also chose Africa for one of their official royal tours, introducing Archie to Archbishop Desmond Tutu in South Africa. Harry even walked in his mother's footsteps in Angola, where she famously raised awareness about landmines. Harry's love of Africa is also shared by William. The two in the past worked together to bring attention to conservation in Africa. But these days, the two brothers don't overlap much. Now questions are mounting ahead of trips both couples will take this year. Harry and Meghan are set to return to the UK next month. There are reports they'll be staying close to William, but have no plans to see each other. Okay, so you might need a flow chart here in early September. Harry and Meghan, they're going to visit both the UK and Germany. As for William, in addition to next month's New York visit, well, he and Kate already announced they're returning to the U.S. in December, heading to Boston for a trip focused on the environment. There you go. All right, pretty cool. Thanks, Joe. Now get your popcorn or coffee ready because it's Friday, which means it's time for our Can't Miss List, the movies, TV shows you should check out this weekend. Yeah, joining us now with some of his top picks is entertainment journalist and pop culture expert Brian Balthazar. Brian, good to have you with us. So, all right, big, big release for anyone who loved Game of Thrones. The prequel, House of Dragon, is, or as we say in Minnesota, Dragon, is finally <laughs> dropping this weekend. So what can you tell us about that? And also another thing, the new She-Hulk show. Right. Lots to watch. Okay, remember Appointment TV, primetime viewing? It is back on Ooh. HBO Sunday night with House of Dragon. And, of course, we all know Game of Thrones. This is a prequel, so it's about 170 years earlier. And what would this series be without the Targaryens and all the dragons, mm. right? So this centers around a king without an heir. And this is going to span 30 years. Uh, it's actually going to have some cast members replaced with older versions of themselves. And it's about a lot of unrest leading up to a civil war. But it has the same beauty. Beautiful cinematography, uh, great cast of characters, and a real, it has the same feel of Game of Thrones. So if you're a Game of Thrones fan, Game of Thrones fan, you will like this, but you don't have to have watched that series to enjoy this one. Love it, love it. Also, Khaleesi, like, obviously, we're so excited to see more of her. And, Joe, I hate to break it to you, but I think it's just Dragon in, in King's Landing. <laughs> uh, okay, Brian, turning to movies and for horror fans, the latest in the Orphan franchise is out today, both streaming and in theaters. Tell us about this film. What's the buzz? Okay, Orphan. So, I don't know if you saw this movie in 2009. It's centered around a young girl who was adopted, and it does not go well, right? And it turns out she's not even a little girl at all. The same actress who played that role in 2009 is playing the role now in a prequel. If you can even, if you can even, like, this is called Orphan First Kill, and it tells why, what went so wrong, what led up to the Orphan film. But it's, it's starring the same actress. And the first one was not loved by critics, but fans loved it, became a cult classic. And this one is a, a, a don't miss movie. I think it's going to be a lot of fun and suspenseful. Ooh, scary. Right. We skipped She-Hulk. We'll just say watch ah. She-Hulk, I guess. And then finally, we should ask watch you about she Idris Elba. Oh, no. Out yeah. this weekend with a new movie, Beast. And then we also have Dragon Ball. What can you tell us about these two movies? Okay, so Idris Elba and his children go to a safari, a, a preserve, uh, as a pleasure trip. But, of course, things go wrong, and an angry lion who is fiercely hunted by poachers is out with a vengeance and wants a taste of Idris Elba. You know, people, fans love Idris Elba and always want a piece of him. Why should this lion be any different? So um, it, it's a suspense thriller, and it's about, about escaping from this danger. And so you can see um, in the trailer right now, everything's going really well. It's going to change real fast, okay? It's going to go bad Real fast. <laughs> Real fast. Dragon Ball? Yeah, yeah, what about Dragon, Dragon Ball? Ball super superhero. If you like anime, you know what it is. If you're not an anime person, you probably don't. This is in theaters. <laughs> and um, again, this is just about action, 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 and a little comedy thrown in. These are characters that if you're an anime lover and love Dragon Ball Super, you will love this. All if right. you don't like anime, this anime movie is not for you, Brian tells us. <laughs> it's not for you, right? Breaking I'm news. here with all the information you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Brian, we love you, though. <laughs>
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Guys. Appreciate it. Mutual. That does Mutual. it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now, so stick with us. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.